uh, it's an uh, ironic privilege in being here. <laughs> And I wanted to acknowledge, and such as this is a lecture, to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Richard Newman, who was a tremendous help to me during the research of this, of this novel. Uh, those of you who knew Richard, who was the head of fellows for the Du Bois Center, knows that he was extremely passionate about African-American entertainers, particularly in the early part of the 20th century. And we would sit in his office and compare notes. And uh, I think I was able to give him some joy about 18 months before he, he became ill because I had been doing research on Valeda in the Netherlands Jazz Archive, where I met a man who was uh, who were, had worked for EMI in London and had recorded Elizabeth Welch um, and Adelaide Hall, but he had a recording of Florence Mills, and nobody thought that there, a, a recording of Florence Mills existed. And Richard said to me with just his eyes w wide as a child, what did she sound like? And I said, she sounded exactly what uh, James Weldon Johnson said. It was just sunshine and, and joy. And uh, he just smiled. And I gave him the details of how to get in touch with this person. But uh, unfortunately, um, things went in another direction. But Richard, as you, those of you who know, knew him, was a most extraordinary person. So my thanks to him. Uh, generally, when I've spoken about Valeda, it's been very much an improv, which is uh, apropos of this being a jazz subject. But when I was asked to, uh, when I, I was invited to come to the, uh, to the Du Bois Center, I had to give a topic. And I was like, oh my God, what do I say? And so I said, okay, truth versus style, the challenge of Valeda Snow. Um, and I have to say, upon uh, thinking about this, I realized that it wasn't so bad a choice. And, there, and uh, as I go through uh, this lecture, um, we're talking about style on three levels. Uh, the first level of style is clothes, actually, and the African-American relationship to clothes and love of clothes and ornament. and. Uh, a friend of mine who was a literary agent in uh, Berlin and loved the book and is, knows English well enough to have been a translator of William Carlos Williams uh, said to me, you know, there's so much about fashion in this book. I've really, I really think, I mean, is, well, what you thinking about? Was this a metaphor for the transitory nature of success? And I just looked at her and I said, well, I guess that's one way that you could consider it. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm a colored woman who likes clothes, running up, read, uh, writing about another colored woman who likes clothes. But uh, in my, my research on in Valade and trying to set the times, I did do a tremendous amount of research on you know, in archives, looking at pictures and so forth. And there is a wonderful book called Styling uh, that came out of, uh, I think, University of Texas by two scholars named White who are not related, talking about the relationship of African Americans and clothes uh, from slavery into other times. And of course, uh, beyond the African love of ornament, either in terms of things you put on or things you do to your body, this w there was this assertion of uh, one's individuality and personality once one got out of the work mode and was able to to wear decent clothes. And if it was only a bandana on um, on one of the festival days that you were allowed on the, uh, the plantation, there was a huge uh, amount of pride. And as we know, creativity and dealing with these these bits of these bits of fabric, uh, bits of glitter, and so forth. And uh, for the African-American entertainer, particularly those in black vaudeville, and, and as we know, if you look at jazz musicians, uh, when you get away from the minstrelsy of the of black, the blacks and blackface tradition and people having to dress up in overalls and uh, 
with huge watermelons in the back and so forth. Everybody wanted to be as resplendent as possible in suits and tuxedos, uh, the women in gorgeous gowns, and Valeda was very, very much of that tradition. Um, so my first, oh, my first selection, oh no, let me stop, I'm sorry about this. I, I drove up from Connecticut and my notes are all over the place. I think I should introduce a bit about Valeda. She was born in Chattanooga in 1904 and she lived till 1956. Uh, she was in a borderline middle class family probably. Her mother was a music teacher uh, who is said to have uh, studied at Howard. No, uh, uh, friends of mine looked in the Ar Howard University archives and there was no record of Etta Washington having been a student there. But uh, I, I surmise from this that she might have been a student at the high school, which e in the 1890s was still a very, a very significant accomplishment. Her father, uh, the latest father, John Snow, is variously described as an entertainer Entertainer, a gambler, the uh, manager of an orphanage, the, the manager of a carnival. I think we can safely say that he was a hustler. Uh, she had several siblings, um, most of whom went into show business. Uh, when I was doing research in London, there is a now defunct jazz archivist news, news journal called Storyville. Um, Storyville was a huge uh, help to me. I spoke to the editor, Laurie Taylor, and he told me that Valeda's brother, Lawrence, passed for white and became a member of a white singing trio in the white time in vaudeville. Uh, she had a sister, Leveda. Until two months ago, I thought she had a sister, Alveda, and certainly all the sources said she had a sister, Alveda. I uh, had heard rumor that Alveda was a man about uh, six months before I completed my, my book. I did try to do some research going into Social Security and draft records, but there was no, there was no record of an Alveda Snow. And I thought, well, this is a very unusual name, so... I don't know if this Alveda Snow existed. Uh, eight weeks ago, somebody informed me that Alveda was Arveda and that he was indeed a man. Now, this is one of the liberties of the novelist. In my novel, uh, Valeda has a younger sister, Laveda, which is absolutely true. And Laveda came up behind her in black vaudeville and so forth. She was an entertainer. And she has an older, a rather demure sister named Alveda, the, the novelist of freedom. Uh, Valeda comes onto the written record at about 1920. She appears in nightclubs in Atlantic City and then on stage in Black Vaudeville in Philadelphia. Previous to that, she was she had to have been in Black Vaudeville. It seems from various testimonies and so forth that she probably left home for the first for the last time in nineteen nineteen when she was fourteen years old. Um, and I'm saying that she left home to audition for a black vaudeville show entitled 3,000 Miles from Jimtown. Now, if you do any research into the black vaudeville uh, names and, and the kind of acts they have, there was a lot of Jimtown and, and Jim some, one thing and Jim the other thing. Uh, and so Valeda goes from Chattanooga to Athens, Georgia, uh, auditions in an alley and gets hired to take the place of a, a chorus girl who has become succumbed to drugs. Now, this chorus girl has a lover, who a, a female lover who is very upset that uh, Valeda, in my novel, it, that Valeda has taken Loretta's place. And so after the first performance, she steals Valeda's precious uh, brooch that has been made by her sister. Valeda, although she's very small, Valeda was only five, uh, four foot ten. She challenges this woman in an alley and almost wins, but the, the woman comes up behind her with a, with a razor and a blues, the, the star of the vaudeville show, a blues queen named Ruby Jones uh, saves Valeda. 
and invites Valeda to come visit her any time she wants to. And so Valeda comes to, to Ruby's dressing room. Valeda opens the door to find a space quite unlike any other in the ramshackle Liberty Theater. Ruby's sparkling dresses, hats, and wraps are protected from the sooty walls from sheets nailed onto their wood. A braided rag rug covers the splintery floorboards. A mirror and a, and a small table covered with various bottles and jars are folded out, for, out of her trunk. Much of the floor not covered by the rug is spotted here and there with sheets of heavy cardboard nailed securely into place. Ruby follows Valeda's eyes to the cardboard. Keeps the rats out, honey. Those rascals are as partial to silks and spangles as they are to naked toes. I spent a good part of my years in dumps like this, and I've learned to provide for my pleasure, my comfort. Ruby herself is wearing a robe the likes of which Valeda has never seen, glistening black with huge hanging sleeves and images of great long-necked birds and reeds bending seductively to and fro. You like my kimono? Valeda can only nod. It comes from Japan. You can touch it if you like. The fabric has a surprising weight to it and a tantalizing texture between rough and smooth that causes, that causes Valeda's heart to beat almost as quickly as the call of a well-played cornet. The scent lifting from the garment in Ruby's great mahogany bosom has a pungent heaviness that is neither fa familiar nor accessible. It's certainly not the toilet water sold through the South by various traveling medicine shows. You've been to sh Japan? Valeda asks. The kimono's birds look like they could step from their inky black with a flap of white, pink, and green wings and carry these two dark women away to another place. The great cut glass stones on Ruby's singing gowns glint and snap in the lantern light. Nope, never did get that far, but I've been to Europe in St. Petersburg, Russia. Never seen so much snow in all my days, but them folks know what to do with it. They wrap themselves in all kinds of furs, got these big fur hats you've never seen the like of, travel around in horse-drawn sleds with little tinkly bells. I didn't know Colody ever went places as far as that, except for with the war. Foreign white folks the same as the ones we have around here. They love to, sing, to see niggas sing and dance. I started sailing across the water when I was smaller than you. Were you scared? No more than you seem to be. This your first time out? Yes, it is. Tell me something, girl. You speak like quality. Where'd you learn to fight like that? Where does anyone? But I would like to thank you for your help. Ruby is studying this young girl whose pose is polite, but whose eyes are devouring all her stuff. You turned your back too soon. I know, Valeda says seriously. I won't do it again. Ruby smiles. I bet you won't at that. Ruby hands Valeda a black and purple gown, dripping cut glass beading and a peacock's fan, fan of spangles that folded and sparkled across her breasts. Oh, I remember this from Chattanooga, Valeda cries softly. When the lights hit, you looked like you could tell the sun to take a rest. It made me happy just to see you standing there. That's part of our jobs, sugar. Most of our folks live lives without a whole lot of brightness. They love to see us singing and dancing, but they want a sport and finery, too. See the shimmer as well as the shake. And I tell you, one of this life's big pleasures is giving them what they want. Hang the dress over on the wall and come and set before the glass. The room turns closer as Valeda moves in next to Ruby. The blues woman's scent has intensified, and the outside of her nostrils have moistened, moistened just a bit as she holds up a compact of light yellow-brown colored paint. Even a fledgling as young and blessed as you needs to learn how to help her gifts. You ever used this before? Well, no, I'm only an, an mama. A Christian lady, is she? The lady nods. She wasn't like some, though. She loved our singing and dancing, but paint in our profession is just another thing you lose, like the beat of the professor's good left hand. Just move it across your cheeks with your fingers, not too much, even like. The color is a good three steps lighter than Valeda's natural complexion. 
You're lucky, breathes Ruby, studying the bloom in Valeda's cheek and the small bones at the base of her neck. You were born halfway there. Our folks love a pretty pale face smiling at them from across the lights. Some of us have to try harder than others. Some of us are out of the game before we start. Strengthen the pink of your lips and the snap of those pretty eyes, and you'll be breaking hearts for sure. Valeda isn't feeling the, the heat of Ruby's gaze as she tries this part and then another. The paint has its own heat and its own weight as well. The face in the glass is hers and not hers. The Valeda of her own invention, a mask as surely as the paper bag cat face she made for Hattie last Halloween. She raises enhanced eyebrows and purses rouged lips, moves her head from side to side to see what happens to her face planes in the light. Where do you get hold of these kinds of creams, she asks. Not in Athens, Georgia. She looks forward to getting better at this. There are stages bigger than those in Athens and Chattanooga, with stronger lights and better chances. I got a lady in New York who sends me stuff when I need it. You can have some. Pay me back as we go along. Oh, thank you, says Valeda. If she draws a line beneath her eye, then looks up with her chin held down, she looks more like Theta Bara than the child her mother knows. What you looking for, girl? The husk in Ruby's voice brings Valeda's, Valeda's tension, a tension out of the mirror. The big woman's hands flash with stones, where rainbows dance about the edges. They are not cut glass. I don't know. I just want to do more, Valeda answers. I guess what some folks would call freedom. It ain't just for asking for the likes of us. You gotta work hard, be ready to step out and stand out. I play the trumpet, says Valeda, looking right back at the woman who's looking right at her. Now, Valeda like a lot of the women uh, from, this from, from this time period, or any time period, was bisexual. Um, and uh, as was Josephine Baker, as Bessie Smith, as Ethel Waters, uh, one of the books that I was a big help for me was the assisted biography of Josephine Baker by one of her, her adoptive sons, John Claude Baker, who runs a restaurant in, in New York called Josephine's. Uh, and he talked to a lot of the chorus girls, and they were, it was very helpful for me to find out what their life was on the road. And basically when he said, he, he seemed to think, being gay himself, was that the women had so much trouble with these men out on the road that they looked to one another for, they were, gir they were girls when they started and they're like kittens in, in these board and boarding houses finding comfort with one another and you know, they did men, they did women. Um, and of course one of the other things about uh, so many of the, the female entertainers of that time is a lot of them do not have children. And there was a time, you know, I was saying, everybody's become sexually active when they're 12, 13, 14 years old. We're the babies. We're the babies. And uh, there was in Valeda's history, popular history, uh, something that she had tried to commit suicide in 1931 she, when she was in a uh, Broadway show with Ethel Waters called Rhapsody in Black. And it was on the front page of the Amsterdam News that she had tried to commit suicide because of this young dancer. And I'm thinking, you know, this, this woman has been sexually active, has had husbands and partners. What's she going to try and commit suicide behind some young boy, whom she did eventually marry, but still, she was ambitious. And a, a, a friend, a white friend who had been on the white time as a, as a child, a, as a blackface entertainer at the age of six, said to me, I wonder if she had an abortion. Because what was said at that time, that you had abortions and you either died or were sterilized. I did some research into the history of abortion and found out that one of the ways that women uh, tried to ab abort themselves or did abort themselves was the use of iodine, which is what the later use uh, in the so-called suicide attempt. But um, the, for me, part of what Valeda, the novel, was about was to try and to get into the skin, the, the emotional and 
and a psychological, spiritual experience of a woman who makes this choice to go out onto the road. Because as we know, um, for women in the the late 19th, early 20th century, well, into the middle of the 20th century, although Valeda did go to school, she was literate, she comes from literacy, uh, while many of her uh, colleagues were not literate, what did she have available to her? She could uh, teach school and remain celibate, uh, have babies, Um, if she didn't feel like teaching school or ran into trouble. She was going to work in, work in somebody's kitchen or uh, work in the fields or do laundry. Uh, the men who went into vaudeville, in a sense, you know, they, it's, it's a slightly safer way to travel as opposed to being chained to a plantation. It was still very dangerous, as we know. But, um, and in the midst of it all, you know, you're dealing with the masks of the performer, which um, I, what Bessie is talking about in terms of their own community, uh, pre- presenting a wonderful uh, remove from the difficulties of the life. But then things changed when you, wa- when you crossed over and started w- performing for white people. As I said, Valeda comes on the, on the record around 1920, and then in 1922, she's at the Barons Exclusive Club in Harlem. The Barons Cl- Exclusive Club was the first of the Harlem clubs that catered to the downtown trade, i.e. white trade, before the Cotton Club, before Connie's Inn. If any of you have seen Lady Sings the Blues, the movie, uh, you see uh, Billy, Diana, or, uh, going from table to table singing, uh, performing the, supposedly performing the ups. Now, the Barons was not that kind of club, but it, it had uh, acts that, per- that performed on the, uh, the dance floor, and then there were, there were singers. Uh, I, don't, I know that Valeda was at the exclusive club. I don't know how she got there. Um, my conceit is that she goes in with two friends as a trio, but then one of the members of the trio gets sick and the other one doesn't want to perform without her. So uh, Bricktop was at the, um, the Barons when Valeda was there. And um, I'm saying that the Bricktop convinces Baron Wilkin, Wilkins to let Valeda have a shot uh, going from table to ga- table. But Valeda is nervous. It was the Baron's white folks that spooked her. Valeda had never pr- performed primarily for white folks before coming to the Barons, and she found it an entirely different game. With colored folk, no matter what the venue, you knew where you stood. If they love you, the love was demonstrated and warm. If they hated you, you could only hope it was just your sent- your sentiments that got hurt. All manners of things could couldn't f- come flying in your direction with the verbal abuse. Peanut shells, pork chop bones, ripe tomatoes, somebody's shoe. But they looked you in the eye while they were doing it. You were part of the family, and they were letting you know how they felt. Not so with white folks, but you wanted that money. It was white folks that had the real money, and not, their, not only their sporting element, white men with jobs or money's, money from their daddies who could throw 50 100 $200 away without feeling any pain. So you found your ways to deal. You kept changing up, changing up, so they could never get a handle on how you did the things you did. The masks you donned when you hit those lights were thicker than what you used with your own and smoother. So any attempt to penetrate just glanced off into the void, and behind those masks you took more pleasure for yourself. You reveled in your body and the music, its glisten under the lights, the vibration in your chest as you sang, the reverberation of your your feet hitting the floor. You played off your partners like birds in a flock or bees in a swarm. You felt communion with the breaths you took, your sweat hitting her, her sweat hitting you, the piano man giving a special lift-off to your steps. And the funny thing was, from behind the mask, you could see that you often frenzied them more than when you were into yourself than when you were selling to them direct. 
It was hard not to think of them of some, as some other kind of being, and tonight Valeda would be facing them on her own, going solo for the cash. The soloists were what the Barons really was about. Moving from table to table, they sang their songs, lingering where the requests and the tips were prime. Interaction was the key to table success and being what the patrons wanted you to be. Valeda had been happy with that stretch of floor between the trio and the others. Now she would have to cross it. The first part of the set had gone well enough. Knowing herself to be neither big enough nor old enough to convince with heavy blues, Valeda had kept to lighter fare, innocent songs filled with sunshine and hope. Combined with a little bit of novelty and Tin Pan Alley love, she has worked out a medley from the colored Broadway hit Shuffle Along with Harley the piano player, and as she goes into the second chorus of Love Can Find a Way, she knows it's time to make her move. Behind the part of her brain that's running the lyrics, she can hear Bricktop's words of encouragement. They're not going to bite you, girl. They're folks, just like you and me. They just have a different style. They think all their money gives them different problems than the rest of us, but it ain't true. So, so don't let that confuse you. They're falling in and out of love. They get scared and tired, and they come to us for, to relax and have some fun. Trouble is, some of them get disconnected from their nature, which mixes them up a bit. Don't concentrate on that. Concentrate on what's the same. They got eyes and ears just like us. They're going to respond to a pretty voice and a sexy little smile. So go on in there and get that money. Valeda moves out of her safety towards the table furthest away on the left, her heart thumping so hard she's lucky to find the beat. There looks to be two couples at the table, which should be easy enough. The, me the men with well-trimmed gray hair, florid cheeks, expensive suits. The women much younger, a platinum blonde, a split-curled brunette, with lavish furs over the, their chairs, even though the night is warm. Chorus girls, probably. Not her business. The man in front is talking to his partner over his shoulder, the brunette's toe working his pant leg towards his knee. Look, Alfie, squawks the brunette. She's coming to us first. The men continue to speak. Valeda was wrong about the foursome. There's a single man at the table as well much younger, a sandy forelock hanging down towards his eyes. He's listening to the men, but he is unfocused. Valeda figures he's been drunk for a good long time. It's not all that easy singing over the conversation, but Valeda concentrates and keeps on, the smoke of cigars nearly making her wretch. Have some manners, you guys, says the brunette. How's a body going to do her work with all this boring business yap? She's got a nice voice. You ought to listen. I like your voice, honey. She continues looking toward Valeda. It's nice. Valeda hasn't finished her song. I like her dress, says the blonde. Where'd you get your dress, honey? But I think it would look better on me in blue. Blue's my color, don't you think, Philip? Brings out my eyes. Honey, where'd you, get, where'd you get your dress? Her song completed, Valeda says her smile. I've got a special source. Time to make eye contact. The brunette is smiling, stupidly, sweetly. The greys are still on about a, a deal on Wall Street. The single is looking at her breasts. Any requests? But who's your source? Philip, Philip, look at that dress. I want a dress like that. Can you find me a dress like that, whines the blonde? Sure thing, baby. Philip answers, anything you want. I want a blues, says the bond. You haven't done any blues. Sing us some blues, baby. Honey, I tend to leave the blues to the Smith sisters, says Valeda. It's more their style. How about Alexander's ragtime band? But you know some blues, encourages the brunette. All you gals know some blues. You got to be what they want you to be. Sure, all of us know something returns Valeda, sneaking a breath she hopes is not too obvious. She starts in with, Baby, won't you please come home? Knowing that Harley will follow her thread, she's not doing so badly because Lord knows she's feeling it. I've got the blues. I feel so lonely. I'd give the world if I could only make you understand. It surely would be grand. The graves have stopped their conversation to stare through their cigar smoke. 
the one in front taking to a slow and lascivious up and down. He's peeling her clothes off with his eyes, tracing on the table what he might be doing with his hands. The brunette slaps his thigh with a guttural chuckle. No, you don't, Alfie, she says. You save all that stuff for me. Alfie adjusts his seat so the brunette's hand can go to his groin. Baby, won't you please won't come home? I need my... Valeda manages close... Oh, I'm sorry. Valeda manages something close to a smile and starts moving around the table, struggling to sway to the music against the beat of her heart. Perspiration is surging under her dress. She imagines it splashing on, onto her shoes. Baby, won't you please come home? I need money. Baby, won't you please come home? Valeda's smile is genuine at the song's end. She's relieved that she somehow made it through without a glitch. The front gray gives her a 20. The ones in back's about to hand her a five until his blonde slaps him with an, Oh, no, you don't. You ain't embarrassing me with that cheap skate shit. You give that girl a 20 and maybe she'll tell me where she got her dress. A second 20 is reluctantly produced. My guy comes here a couple times a week, but I don't know where he stays, says Valeda. I wish I could be more helpful. You guys have a good evening. She's about to leave when the single grabs her hand and pulls her over to his seat. He's holding a $100 bill, but knowing that there's something more to it than that, Valeda's smile goes slightly wary. She wants to pull away, but his hold is firm. He's mouthing and gesturing slightly, s silently. Come here, come here, easing her closer. When she is right by his side, he folds the bill with one hand then moves it in the direction of her bosom. Valeda wills herself to stillness. He doesn't grope as he places the money in her dress. He does it gently, reverently, then he lays his head quietly against her breasts. It is the gesture of a child. Valeda resists the electricity running up and down her arms, screaming that she slap him across the face and shove him backwards onto the floor. She gives him the slightest beat, clears her throat as prettily as she can, as she can muster, then moves on to the next table, singing Love Can Find a Way. Bricky knew the signal. Oh, yeah, young Van Buren. Boy just loves himself some colored tits. Had a toffee-colored mammy, the only mother he ever knew. I've gotten that hundred two or three times. He's harmless. Weird, but harmless. You did okay tonight, honey. So what do you think? About So what do you think about working solo? Not bad coming up with the blues that ended asking for money. I figure you're a natural. What do you think? I think I'm never going to do that again, Valeda replied slowly. I hated it. You did. Any requests? But who's your source? Philip, Philip, look at that dress. I want a dress like that. Can you find me a dress like that, whines the blonde? Sure thing, baby. Philip answers, anything you want. I want a blues, says the blonde. You haven't done any blues. Sing us some blues, baby. Honey, I tend to leave the blues to the Smith sisters, says Valeda. It's more their style. How about Alexander's ragtime band? But you know some blues encourages the brunette. All you gals know some blues. You got to be what they want you to be. Sure, all of us know something, returns Valeda, sneaking a breath she hopes is not too obvious. She starts in with, baby, won't you please come home, knowing that Harley will follow her thread. She's not doing so badly because Lord knows she's feeling it. I've got the blues. I feel so lonely. I'd give the world if I could only make you understand. It surely would be grand. The graves have stopped their conversation to stare through their cigar smoke. The one in front taking to a slow and lascivious up and down. He's peeling her clothes off with his eyes, tracing on the table what he might be doing with his hands. The brunette slaps his thigh with a guttural chuckle. No, you don't, Alfie, she says. You save all that stuff for me. Alfie adjusts his seat so the brunette's hand can go to his groin. Baby, won't you please won't come home? I need my... Valeda manages close... To... Oh... I'm sorry, Valeda manages something close to a smile and starts moving around the table, struggling to sway to the music against the beat of her heart. Perspiration is surging under her dress. She imagines it splashing on, onto her shoes. 
Baby, won't you please come home? I need money. Baby, won't you please come home? Valeda's smile is genuine at the song's end. She's relieved that she somehow made it through without a glitch. The front gray gives her a twenty. The ones in back's about to hand her a five until his blonde slaps him with an, Oh, no, you don't. You ain't embarrassing me with that cheap skate shit. You give that girl a twenty and maybe she'll tell me where she got her dress. A second twenty is reluctantly produced. My guy comes here a couple times a week, but I don't know where he stays, says Valeda. I wish I could be more helpful. You guys have a good evening. She's about to leave when the single grabs her hand and pulls her over to his seat. He's holding a hundred-dollar bill, but knowing that there's something more to it than that, Valeda's smile goes slightly wary. She wants to pull away, but his hold is firm. He's mouthing and gesturing slightly, s silently. Come here, come here, easing her closer. When she is right by his side, he folds the bill with one hand, then moves it in the direction of her bosom. Valeda wills herself to stillness. He doesn't grope as he places the money in her dress. He does it gently, reverently. Then he lays his head quietly against her breasts. It is the gesture of a child. Valeda resists the electricity running up and down her arms, screaming that she slap him across the face and shove him backwards onto the floor. She gives him the slightest beat, clears her throat as prettily as she can, as she can muster, then moves on to the next table, singing Love Can Find a Way. Bricky knew the signal. Oh, yeah, young Van Buren. Boy just loves himself some colored tits. Had a toffee-colored mammy, the only mother he ever knew. I've gotten that hundred two or three times. He's harmless. Weird, but harmless. You did okay tonight, honey. So what do you think about so what do you think about working solo? Not bad coming up with the blues that ended asking for money. I figure you're a natural. What do you think? I think I'm never going to do that again, Valeda replied slowly. I hated it. You didn't hate the money, smiled Bricky. No, the money is good, agreed Valeda. I'd be happy to keep it coming, and I thank you for helping me out. But I hated them being so close, like they were pushing up against me and I didn't have room to move. I never had, I never had our own so close, let alone those Fays. You'll get used to it, says Bricktop. It's a skill, like anything else. No, I won't, Valeda said pensively. I'm not like you, Bricky. You invite everyone in, like the Cubs' your own private parlor. That's your style, and you work it really well. You think I'm letting those folks into my real privacy, letting them know everything I am? Bricktop was looking straight into Valeda's eyes. It's an act, honey. It's always an act. Hospitable and friendly just happens to be mine. I saw you tonight. You got past that first table and kept the room interested. You'll find your stride, and you'll do just fine. It's not for me, Bricky, Valeda said firmly. I don't want people thinking that they can know me that well. I need the line. I learned that tonight. You one headstrong little bitch, I'll give you that, Bricktop laughed. Now buy us, some, buy us another pitcher with some of that m money from your titties so I can figure out what I'm going to say to Mr. Wilkins later tonight. Now, before I read the next uh, excerpt, which shows that Valeda did manage to get over some of that, that, uh, that feeling of not wanting to connect, um, let me say that there is a truth, to, a, a truth to that in the way that Valeda performed. Now, I actually, well, I, I saw a clip of her from a French movie uh, several years ago in uh, Amsterdam, and on Sunday, I saw two soundies of hers that were made uh, in, there was, a, there was a program at the Bryn Mawr Theater, and uh, they got some, some jazz soundies, and I saw two of Valeda when she was in, uh, in her late 40s um, interacting with the orcs. But, but people said that there was a distance to Valeda. There was an amazing, amazing uh, char charisma you know, she sang and danced. She played the trumpet, the piano, and the violin in performance. She conducted. She arranged music. She she wrote music. She produced shows. She was really multi-talented. And when I think sometimes, um, 
why didn't she concentrate on what happened to her? Sometimes I think of Orson Welles, who was so talented that he kind of lost himself. But ultimately, I don't think that was what happened with Elena. I think she she broke taboos and she um, uh, told a a rather unfortunate lie, which now people, some people do know is a myth, but at, at the time, some people did and some people didn't, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but a f- a woman that I interviewed who used to work for the Pittsburgh Courier said that she saw Valeda with in a benefit performing with Duke Ellington in the early 50s. And she said there was some they were very similar. There was a there was sophistication, charisma, but a distance. And this is one of the things with Valeda. She was not like so many people, like Ethel Waters, like Josephine Baker, so many people that were performing because they wanted love, that they needed love. Valeda, I believe, came from love. And so what she wanted was to show herself. She wanted to do what she could do, and it didn't matter that she was small. She was African-American from the South. She just went anywhere she needed to to go. That was all over the world. First time she left the country was to go to Shanghai, China, with a band of 26, and she stayed for two years. And she she came back. She was tra- she was traveling here, and then she well, she couldn't performed like she wanted to, so she went to Europe, and all of her recording, the, the main part of her recordings are made in Europe. But she just wouldn't stop it. It wasn't love me, love me. It was think I'm terrific, but you know, I love myself and I love what I do. And that, and that is something of a difference. Um, and I think possibly a reason why some people, some people didn't remember her. But I think on the other hand, and I'll get to this after I read this last portion, uh, in terms of truth and style and myth, uh, uh, it had to do with her, her myth and then this whole problem of gender and the trumpet. Um, Valeda was performed at the Grand Terrace Ballroom uh, with Earl Father Hines uh, after she had been in the Lou Leslie show, Rhapsody in Black. Uh, Lou Leslie had built the show around Valeda, but he forgot that he had a contract with Ethel Waters. Ethel Waters came in, got her own songs written, and uh, there was a big battle going on between Ethel and, and Valeda, and essentially Ethel won. Um, Ethel Waters was a very complex woman, and she had a very loving persona on stage, but she was a very difficult woman, hated uh, women who were more petite and prettier than she. She was bisexual, absolutely, but uh, if a if some chorus girl was looking at the man that she was with at, the, at that particular time, she would throw said chorus girl down the stairs. Now, my aunt is uh, an actress and director, and many years ago, uh, in the late 40s, uh, Ethel had wanted to uh, do a revival of Mamba's Daughters. My aunt was, an, was, a, was a dancer, had just started with Lee Strasberg, and went in, you know, was convinced to do this, to do this uh, role. She was doing line, running lines with Ethel in Ethel's hotel room, and she looked very, very young at that time. She was only about 19, my aunt. And finally, after a couple of days, Ethel said, Honey, I know you have heard a lot about me, and most of it's true, but I know when and with whom, and it's not you. So relax. If I had wanted you, I would have already had you. But anyhow... After um, Valeda lost the battle of uh, uh, Rhapsody in Black, she went to the Grand Terrace Ballroom, and this is where she started producing shows. Now, there is testimony in the world of Earl Father Hines from from band uh, band members who worked with her. She had a tremendous amount of respect for her her charisma, her stamina, her creativity, and her ability to play the horn. Now, this next uh, sequence is based on a, something that really happened, only it happened in the Royal Theater and not in the Grand Terrace. Um, Grand Terrace worked better for me. This is in Chicago in 1933. Valet is 29 years old. She enters for her last singing chorus 
with the sweat of the dancing choruses streaming down her torso, the double satin of her costume only not only just not clinging to her bush, grateful that no fabric shields her privates from the little bit of air shifting up between her legs. Her scalp is throbbing from thirteen stitches snaking down the back of her head t- toward her neck, and shouldn't she have known better than getting into an automobile with Tom- Thomas Fats Waller when lovable as he was, the man simply stayed drunk. She'd found herself resorting to the happy dust again, and it had done its business, numbed her pain throughout her show, because it is her show. She has produced this show. She had responded, yes, I can, when Ed Fox asked, you think you can handle this, Valeda? Fox might have been thinking money saved in his ongoing wage dispute with his old producer, but Valeda was knowing her answer as opportunity. She'd taken those Hollywood musicals as inspiration, the elegant black and white of their costumes, the lines of dancers in shifting patterns. She had selected the music, got some new numbers written, in fact, drilled the chorus girls, showed Earl's Earl's band to its advantage, and herself as well. The audience has loved it, been stomping down for more, and now, as she's preparing for her last chorus and the blessed relief of a backstage recline, Earl is beckoning her to the bandstand and his white Beckstein piano. Come on up here, Valeda, he's saying, teeth flashing bright in that pretty black walnut face of his. We got something for you. One of the band walks forward holding a gleaming handful of brass. The other musician's vamping as he makes his way through the stands. No, you don't. Not my trumpet. Not now. Not with my lungs heaving from the effort of five tap choruses against a line of teenage girls. Earl is smiling. All of the guys are smiling, but not all of the smiles are friendly. God damn you, Earl. God damn you. Valeda's smiling, too. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'd agree with me that in this little bundle of dynamite resides one of the race's foremost female stars. The crowd of brown and white sporting folk looks expectant, and the band is steady vamping, smiling, and vamping. The mirror ball above the show floor dispersing a milky way of starlight. Not now, Earl. Not with my lips still tingling from the chill of that goddamn cocaine. My heart's thumping so hard I'd be hard-pressed to find a beat. But Earl's going on. This girl's more, got more talent than she knows what to do with. She's not only one hell of a little performer. She produced tonight's show all by herself. Who needs Hollywood when here in Chicago we got the, the Grand Terrace? Don't do this to me, Earl. Where's your heart, for goodness sake? Valet's, uh, Valeda's eyes pleading, and Earl's smile bespeaking mischief. Now, you already know that this little lady no- knows her way around a horn, but usually she's strutting her stuff out there on the show floor. Don't do this to me, you bastards. Now you're going to let me in, in after all these weeks of keeping me off the, ba- the box. You chitlin-eating, mamma-jamming bastards. Tonight... Me and the fellows would like to invite her up on the bandstand for an extra special encore of our great new number, Bubbling Over with Beer. Come on up here, Valeda. Don't go shy on me, baby. Valeda steps up to accept the trumpet to the kind of applause she figures Christians heard on their way to meet the lions. Her heart's throbbing strongly as she breathes into the mouthpiece and works the valves. The house before her is swimming, and Earl steady talking. Now, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's not every musician that holds with honeys blowing from a bandstand. A few might even tell you it's damn unlucky. But tonight, we're making an exception for this little lady here, because I think you'll all agree she's a veritable little Louie. You ready, Valeda? Valeda's nodding smile is a bright bristle of stilettos. All right, Crow's Earl, here we go. Valeda never knew where her wind came from that night or where the lips that had, been num- that had been numbed by cocaine found their burr. With her lungs raw from choruses she had danced, with her belly heavy from the evening, evening's pot roast dinner, with the stitches on her, lo- her scalp outlined in heat like a salamander in flame, Valeda listened hard and en- entered the music. She knew bubbling over. 
She had wrung it out of Louis Dunlop and Charlie Carpenter for this, her, her show. She had scattered its changes to the chorus girls. She knew where it had been and where it could go. After the, me the melody's intro and Earl's left-hand to right-hand cascades of piano sound, her space was opened and Valeda jumped in. She blew. She felt the horn in her hand surrounded by a shaft of golden light, and she blew beyond herself. She entered the music and saw its symmetry all around her. She saw the chords, embellishes, the references to other songs as plain as day behind her eyeballs, and she used them. She jumped from bar to bar like a benzene-fueled billy goat. She didn't miss. She hit her peaks and whinnied in triumph. Her stitches split with the force of, of her blowing, and blood came snaking down her neck. She didn't notice. She, she was aware of nothing but the construction of this architecture of sound. She traded fours with Cecil Irwin and Walter Fuller, and eight after eight with Earl. In the nebula light of the terrace's mirror ball, she flew with men who had backed Louis Armstrong at his best. At the end, it was as though she didn't know where she had been. The crowd was on its feet. Purple gang monsters were throwing hundred-dollar bills on the floor. She was drenched now, her makeup gone, the roots of her hair on their way back to nature, and her costume beyond re redemption, sho soaked as it was by her Niagara of sweat and blood. She had played. She hadn't just acted cute and entertained. She had played. Earl lifted her arm high and squeezed her hand as they took her ball, uh, their, their bow. Earl Hines is known as a ladies' man with good reason. He and Valeda would have some memories to love around in this night, but they wouldn't recapture the ecstasy they reached on the bandstand in this music. Nothing could. Now, in terms of the self-creation, I think it is, first of all, a, uh, an emblem of the entertainment, of any entertainment industry, the show business, people do their own biographies. When Valeda went to London, and she was a huge success in London, she came over in Blackbirds of 34 and 35. She was in the gossip columns, the, you know, the regular newspapers and a melody maker uh, at least a couple of times a month. Uh, I, would, I was seeing interviews with her saying that she had born, been born in California. And I thought to myself, what's that all about? And then I realized, now she probably said, they, somebody said, where were you born, Miss Snow? And she said, Chattanooga. And she said, what was that? And they said, what was that? She said, California. <laughs> you know, because they knew where that was. She said that Louis Armstrong was one of her teachers. People compared her to, to uh, Louis Armstrong. She played very much in his style. Louis was huge in London, huge. Alberta Hunter was over a, a little bit before, a couple of years before uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, the difference in their ages was not much. We know that in Louis Armstrong and everybody in this country knew that Louis Armstrong came from New Orleans, but Alberta Hunter's talking about she was his babysitter in New York City when he was growing up. You know, people just created what people, folks wanted from them. <laughs> um, I think this reflex, which is not just a function of show business, but seems to me to be, and I'm not at his, a, 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 a form, Jesus, I'm sorry. <laughs> it should be me, right? It should be me. <laughs> um, if I'd been the audience, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that um, certainly in the United States where people left their histories behind, but... Jesus Christ. Now that. I can't turn it off. It's a cheap, it's a cheap U.S. cell phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, because my UK, my UK, my UK sh phone was entire, would have been entirely too expensive. My, 
Uh, it's off now. It's off now. It, it just doesn't re respond as well as the one that costs 200 pounds. Anyway, uh, um, excuse me. As, I'm, as, I'm, as I was saying, you know, this cult of creating one's own history as well as one, one's own myth, the greatest show on earth, the, you know, the best crab cakes in, in the world or in Des Moines, um, the couturier who is a prince who is really a, t a tailor in, the, you know, in Calabrese. That is very much the tradition here. Now, the big myth about Valeda, and, you know, part of the thing about uh, African-American performers from the very beginning is that they created their own their, their own thing. And there is a quote in um, Terrible Honesty by Ann Douglas, which was a really, really important book to me. And um, she, the, she quotes a, p a pianist is playing, or a piano player, as saying, nobody ever told it straight. Even, it, uh, even if, it, as it was happening, we was inventing it. And don't think that that was no accident, neither. Um, they had control over their lives for the first time. And if they wanted to be from some place, have accomplished something, they said it. There was nobody to say that that was wrong. The late, and certainly, I think that this kind of thing might have, must have started with the Industrial Revolution when people left their, their, their traditional homes where there were generations of folk who knew who you were, knew your, where people knew your name. And you could go someplace else and nobody knew who your people were. And so you could keep with your own people or go someplace else. Now, the, if people know about the latest snow, what they know is that she played the trumpet and that she was in a concentration camp, that she was trapped behind, uh, she was trapped behind enemy lines in Denmark and when the Germans invaded in 1940, and uh, she was put into a concentration camp as being part of a despised race, etc. This myth was embellished in the 80s when a woman named Rosetta Wright started collecting recordings from. Uh, early jazz female instrumentalists. And from being in a concentration camp, v Valeda also threw herself in front of a child who was about to be whipped by an SS guard. And she had to have plastic surgery when she returned to the United States because of all of the, the um, scars on her back. Uh, when I started on Valeda, I too believed that she was the jazz Joan of Arc. And it wasn't until I went to Denmark for the first time that I found out that that was not true. It took three trips to Denmark for me to, to find the truth of it. And that was that um, she had been picked, she had lost her work permit uh, because her female lover had committed suicide but, uh, with a morphine uh, medicine. Valeda herself was addicted to morphine, which was not against the law. What was against the law was not to report to the alien police every week. She was indigent. She, was on the, she wasn't on the street, but she didn't report two weeks in a row, and they picked her up, and they put her in jail. Vesta Fengsel, if people know, have read anything about her talking about Vesta Fengsel concentration camp, Vesta Fengsel is, is, means Western prison and is the main prison in uh, Denmark. Uh, it's still operational, and I went there, and I met the prison governor and the prison historians. They went into their records to find out about you know, what they could about Valeda. At the time, we all thought she had been there for a year and a half. As it happened, she was only in, incarcerated for about 13 weeks, and part of that was five weeks uh, a cold turkey withdrawal from morphine. I thought that Valeda must have come up with a story in 1942 when she was coming back to this country. And she was looking bad. She'd been gone for six years. And she's thinking, i got to come up with a better story than I was indigent on drugs to talk about why I am so thin. And that she came talking about um, I was uh, in a concentration camp. But that is not what happened. Uh, she, there was an interview in the, in the Amsterdam News when she arrived. I, it wasn't until the last two months of my uh, research, no, my writing, that I thought, 
there must have been an interview, and I saw then, after I had thought that she made this decision on the, on the trip, that she came and said she had been very careful with her money and she hadn't been in jail. It wasn't until she was about to go uh, on stage for the first time some 10 months later at the Apollo. She had, she had, had an, a uh, nervous breakdown, which I only know because one of my father's oldest friends was a student nurse on the Bellevue uh, psychiatric ward and happened to be there. And, um, and suddenly in Dan Burley's entertainment column, there is something that says uh, Valeda was in a concentration camp. Uh, my feeling, and there was also previous to that, she'd gone out to Los Angeles to try and get back together with her, her husband, Nyes Barry. And there was some, a little blurb in the Chicago Defender saying, uh, laid us snow out on the coast talking some weird stuff about Europe. But it was only uh, before she went into the Apollo. And I thought, oh, somebody says, well, that's a good story. We'll go with that. And three years later, she finds out what a concentration camp was with the liberation of Dachau and Buchenwald. Um, some people who knew about, who knew, who suspected that she hadn't been in a concentration camp. In 56, of a stroke, after having played a, a, a week at the um, Palace Theater in New York. And she had a, she had a stroke. She went and had a coma for three years weeks and then she died. That's, although her style of playing had, it had, the styles had moved on, she was still going strong. She was playing in the best clubs on both, clo uh, both coasts while was, her, some of her colleagues were washing out bedpans and operating elevators. Valeda was entertaining, making people happy, and looking good. And <laughs> while she did it, and um, she was not an easy woman, but uh, a really admirable one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should open up for uh, questions. Uh, we want to but yes, please. I think absolutely. I mean, in, in terms of writing this book, uh, I had to make some decisions as well. That there were things that I wanted to do in terms of exploration. Um, there were people who said, just take the easy road, just, you know, make a good story. But I wanted to um, follow the truth of the later. As much as, I, as much as I could because I knew that this would be most people's first introduction to her. On the other, but there, in one instance in particular, I stepped out into, into style as the servants of the, of the fundamental truth of Valeda in the book, and that is, um, again, the story about the, the abortion. Uh, I don't know that Valeda had an abortion, but to me, the Valeda that I had come to know would not have stepped out of competition on Broadway with Ethel Waters to uh, have an abortion because of some young boy. The abortion made more sense to me. There is absolutely no way to substantiate it. I do, I have heard from uh, oral histories that Valeda had abortions. Why not then? It seemed to make a whole lot more sense. And it, it went with the style of, that I was putting up in ter terms of th how this wo the style of how this woman lived her life. But I believed it was the fundamental truth of it. The, the, the Valeda of the book is my Valeda. Uh, but I think, and I already know some things that are wrong, like the, that her, her sister was her brother. Well, again, about three, three months before I'd finished the manuscript, I found out that Valeda had gone out on, uh, in vaudeville when she was about 11 years old. And I was like, oh, my God, I finished her childhood like years ago. Um, 
and I had to make a decision. This will change the balance of the book, the balance of the who she is with her siblings and her mother and father very much because her mother was, uh, her father was the manager of this child act. I did not feel that it fundamentally would have changed how Valeda felt about the family, about having babies, what she probably felt about her father, which is that she admired his um, independence of spirit, but she couldn't trust him more than Dan, and she wasn't going to really ever trust a man. Um, and that was the novelist style. And, but I felt that the, truth, that, that the basic truth was not really affected by that uh, because I believe, despite the fact that she went out, that she felt the same way, and that's how she approached her, her life. Is, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. She was making it up, and those are, those are real letters. Uh, they, those were the own. There are other letters in the book that I made up, and <laughs> and but when I saw her prison records, and I have to say the Danes were amazingly generous to me because legally, uh, her her records were closed for 80 years, which would have been two, 2020, uh, 2022, but. One prison governor said to the other, well, they're your records, and you can look at them if you want. And when I came seven, six months later, they gave, I, I looked at them, and I gave them back. They said, no, you can have them, and that included these letters. Um, yes, she had a husband and a three-year-old child, and that is, I'm going to try everything to get out of here. And apparently, the, um, the prison governor was known for being very sympathetic. This was a women's prison, but he was very sympathetic to the traditional woman. So she's trying to like work her show to get out of there. And it was very unusual for, for inmates to write letters. As everywhere else, most of the, the Danish women who were in the prison were working class and would never have thought to, to deal with you know, a bourgeois, to address a bourgeois trying to get out but Valeda didn't care. Now, an interesting thing in terms of my, my writing is I gave, I gave the book uh, a manuscript to a, an English friend of mine, and he said to me, you know, Candace, the, the style of the of those two sets of letters are very different. She's so, you know, much more eloquent. <laughs> and I, those, the earlier letters, and I said, thank you very much. <laughs> and I didn't, Changed, I didn't change the earlier letters much. I just kind of changed some of the punctuation and a couple of tenses in her, her, her own letters to make it a bit more consistent, and also with somebody who was suffering, uh, you know, was drug withdrawal as well. So, there we go. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Bricktop was everybody's, everybody's mentor. She really was. You know, she went, when Josephine went to Paris and could barely write, you know, Bricktop said, get a stamp. You know, and eventually she did learn to write, though not well. Any other questions? Yes. There is. There were two French movies. I only saw one. One was called Les Piages, and it was about white slavery, starring Maurice Chevalier. And she was just standing in the band, <laughs> you know, doing the, band, the little band number, and you see her, and then you don't see her. Um, but there were there were several soundies, of which I, two of which I saw on Sunday for the first time with the Ali Balbert trio. Now I believe that she made some in the 30s, 
Uh, I got over to the United States lots of times to do my, for, for research and got all over the place, but I did not linger long enough in either L.A. or at the Library of Congress to, to dig out the other soundies. But when she, the Alibaba is kind of her, a bit past her prime, although a big, beautiful, she's singing fabulously, she doesn't play that much, but I know that when she was at Sebastian's Cotton, Cl Cotton Club in Culver City that she did make a series, you know, make several soundies there, and there she was at, at her best. Yes, sir. Yes. No, she had no, she had no contact with Brobson. Elizabeth Welsh was in Chocolate Dandies, and Valeda was the fourth, the fourth lead in Chocolate Dandies. Elizabeth Welsh was in the chorus, as was Josephine Baker. Um, I actually, Elizabeth Welsh was still alive when I started working on this, and she was in a nursing home. She had just gone into the nursing home in, uh, outside of London, and I tried to contact her because uh, uh, Chris Ellis, the guy who had the head in the Netherlands who had done the recordings with uh, Elizabeth Welsh and Adelaide Hall, said you may, he knew that she knew her, but he also knew that she didn't like Valeda. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I corresponded with the, um, the matron of the nursing home, but Welsh didn't, she said was no longer seeing people, but I think she just, uh, although I, 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 I coached, couched it as though I really wanted to learn about her and do, you know, do a thing on her, uh, she, wanted, she did not want to be disturbed in her last days by Valeda Snow. Many people did not think that Valeda was a lady. Um, I have, there is an anecdote, my, my uncle, Luther Henderson, who passed away two years ago and was, at, to that point, the last uh, arranger that worked with Ellington coming out of, uh, uh, who, who survived coming out of Juilliard. Uh, when, early on in my time working on Valeda, I'm sitting at, uh, in, my aunt, in his apartment, and he says, now girls ain't supposed to play no horn. And this protege of his said, Luther, I don't believe you're saying that in your aunt's house, in your, in your wife's house. He said, okay, okay, I'm going to call Benny and see if he knows. He was talking about Benny Carter. And so he called Los Angeles. To, and uh, he says, Benny, you know, did you know Valeda Snow? And Benny said, I knew of Valeda Snow, of course, but I did not know her. Later research melody maker week after week after week after week in the 34 and 35, I find out that Benny Carter and Valeda Snow are in London at the exact same time. Now, we know that the community of African Americans, let alone African American entertainers, all hanging out in the West End and Soho and so on and so forth, there is no way that they couldn't have encountered one another. But also, in my work at the Netherlands Jazz Archive, somebody, there was some kind of document that said that Valeda was playing in a club uh, in The Hague while Coleman Hawk Hawkins was playing not in The Hague but nearby. They didn't play together, but they did party together. And that same week, Coleman Hawkins was recording with Benny Carter. Now, I know that Benny Carter knew Valeda Snow. But Benny Carter was always a gentleman, and somewhere along the line, I believe he, he decided that he did not, you know, he, that Valeda Snow was not his definition of a lady, that uh, he didn't know Valeda Snow, and at 90-plus years old, he definitely didn't know Valeda Snow. Okay. <laughs> Lonnie. Well, actually, in terms of being an assistant director in Hollywood, uh, gender was far more the problem than race. And in fact, I had been doing my work for a long time. I was a first AD. It would no longer made me nervous. I was working on a very silly pilot for a sitcom with a director I, I, I liked very much, Bill Bixby, actually. And I was having a lot of trouble 
with the head electrician. Nothing I did. And I did not yell. I'm, you know, I was all into diplomacy always. That was my style. Nothing worked with him. And then finally on the thir third day, I figured it out. I said, oh, my God, this guy's a racist. There's nothing I can do. And I just hadn't encountered racial stuff. It was more problems with the black men that I had encountered in, in Hollywood uh, not wanting me to be doing that job. I, wor I tended to, I did, yes, a lot of stuff with Sidney Poitier, but I'd worked on most more white projects. I found that easier, actually. And I think that that is taking myself, as I believe was the same for Valeda in Europe. I'm not a white woman. I'm not governed by the same, cons you know, moral constrictions. Uh, we are outside of their morality. As, uh, so as long as I was polite and I knew what I was doing, I didn't have to defer to them, but they didn't interact with, that was not, they weren't dealing with me. This is a woman telling me what to do. Um, people ask me, oh, were, were the Europeans so much more enlightened uh, to let the later, because she had to go to Europe, she had to leave this country in order to get recorded um, until the very end. And my feeling is, no, not at all. They didn't want their women playing the trumpet. But, you know, Valeda is an exotic. And so she is not governed by the same, the same morality. And the thing that brought me to Valeda, as opposed to ri writing about how I grew up colored in Stanford, Connecticut, or the black group, was that I, living, you know, living in uh, London and had previously lived in Berlin, knew this thing about what it's like to be cross-cultural wire walk. And now some people talk about, well, how, you know, Denmark's so wonderful. How could she have done this? And you're going to love Denmark. The first time I went to Copenhagen, it was cold. The, you know, it was winter. It was lovely atmosphere, lovely atmosphere, pedestrian area. I felt so alone. And I, saw, and I was walking through these streets, and I was imagining Valeda. When, and I saw pictures in the Museum of the Resistance of the, when the Germans were there with all of their, you know, the uniforms. And so then how did this small woman by herself, because she went with her lover, they deported him, she wanted to stay because she was still working well. And the, 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 the public spaces in Copenhagen are huge. And I was thinking, how did she feel walking around here all by, by herself? And here I am, you know taller, I'm not afraid of white people, there aren't Germans, you know, I'm integrated, everything's fine. And I feel not right. And so this type of thing, you know, my, my, my editor wants to, to shorten the Shanghai portion when she first gets there. And I argued very hard about it. I wanted it to be slow like an opium dream. And I said, this is the first time that this southern black girl has been outside the country and she's going someplace that she can't even conceive of. So from the time that the Yangtze comes into the, into the, into the ocean and the, the water goes from, from green to brown to everything she sees, it's a new cultural experience. And that is what, where my commonality is with Valeda. Really in terms of who I identify in the book, is the created character, Castor McHenry, who is a gay pianist that I had to create because Valeda wasn't interested in politics or avant-garde art and, and music, and I, I knew this, and so I had to create somebody who was. <laughs> and also, and also um, ask her questions about, what did you think you were doing? And why did you jeopardize, you know, your, why did you cheapen yourself with some of these things that you did? I needed to ask her that. And it didn't make sense. She was not a woman's woman, really. I don't think she had a lot of girlfriends. She had some, but by and large. And I thought a gay guy, that would be more appropriate. There was a gay journalist in London who interviewed me for the book before it was published. And he was, he thought, well, you know, Valeda's you, right? And I said, no. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> you know. And I, he said, I said actually, uh, Castor McHenry is me. He said, what? <laughs> a gay man? <laughs> I said, yeah. You got a problem with that? <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.